right. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and um, welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm, I'm Brad Graham, the um, co-owner of, of the bookstore, uh, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And uh, we have what promises to be a quite an inf informative and, uh, and revealing um, discussion for you this afternoon uh, around uh, a new book written by law professor Tanya Kateri Hernandez called Racial Innocence, Unmasking Latino Anti-Black Bias and the Struggle for Equality. Uh, professor Hernandez is on the faculty at uh, Fordham University where she specializes in comparative race relations and anti-discrimination law. In her new book, she examines the, the issue of racism among Latinos in areas of schooling, housing, employment, and public spaces. Uh, it's an often uh, overlooked or uh, ignored topic. It's uh, obviously a potentially controversial one. Uh, but as an uh, Afro-Latina herself, Professor Hernandez brings not only academic research and legal case studies, but also personal stories to her treatment of this, uh, this complicated issue. Uh, so, so much of the discussion of, of racism in this country has tended to focus on a mistreatment of non-whites by whites. What Professor Hernandez describes as a more complex situation detailing how Latinos, although often denying uh, that they can be racist because of their ethnicity and multicultural background, uh, all too often are, are themselves far from colorblind. In fact, as Professor Hernandez documents, anti-blackness unfortunately continues to exist and fester uh, among a number of Latinos. Uh, Kirkus um, called Professor Hernandez's work an important book that reveals many interwoven complexities of American racism, and Publishers Weekly described it as a distressing examination of racism's insidious effects. Now, discussing uh, the book and its uh, arguments this afternoon will be a, a panel of, of people uh, expert on, on race uh, and the law. Uh, moderating the discussion will be Tania Hope, who directs the uh, Ralph Bunch International Affairs Center at Howard University and has more than two decades of experience in the international exchange, um, uh, uh, in the, the fields of international exchange, international education, and, and management. Others on, on the panel are uh, Justin uh, Hansford, it's a law professor at Howard, uh, where he directs the Third, Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center, uh, and is a leading scholar and activist in the fields of critical race theory, human rights, and uh, law and social movements. Uh, Robin Lenhart is a leading scholar on race and the family, who's on the faculty of Georgetown Law School and co-leads the university's Interdisciplinary Racial Justice Institute uh, and uh, we also have Manuel Mendez, who chairs the DC Afro Latino Caucus. And I realize going through all those names, not having them up here, you probably now have no idea who's who when they come out. So I may, we may quickly have each of them say their names once they get seated. So here they come. Okay, so do you all, um, you, you all just want to uh, uh, quick, quickly say your names, and um, I'm going to give you this mic here. Uh, Hi, I'm Tanya Cateri Hernandez. Thank you for coming out. Hi, my name is Manuel Mendez. Hi, good evening. I'm Tania Hope. I'm Robin Linhart, and I'm so happy my friend has a great book out. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Justin Hansford. Okay, so we're gonna get started because we don't have a lot of time and this is a subject that could take like days, but we're gonna do the best we can here. Um, and so to jump right in, I'm just gonna ask Tanya to please talk a little bit about her book. Uh, well, oftentimes people ask me sort of why I wrote the book. Um, I guess that's not such a unusual question to, uh, to ask someone. Uh, and part of it is both academic and also very personal. Um, it is a book that is about trying to uncover all the ways in which uh, Latinidad, uh, that is Latin communities uh, within the United States, 
um, are much more complex and racially uh, fraught than we otherwise like to tell the world and the world likes to uh, even consider. Right? Uh, otherwise, we are just Hispanics who are <laughs> uh, viewed as one monolith. Uh, a, a racial group uh, without any races within it, uh, and that erases a long legacy of um, the aftermath of slavery, uh, which was much more predominant within Latin America and the Caribbean. Quick little factoid, right? Uh, some estimate 65 to 90 percent of the transatlantic, transatlantic slaves that were brought to the Americas were brought to Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, whereas in the, what we now call the United States, it's just about 3.5 percent. So you put that in perspective, that means that the story of uh, slavery is a very Espanol story huh? um, and Portuguese story, uh, and that the legacy of it, and one doesn't you know, come away from that that quickly, um, is just as meaningful uh, a part of our backgrounds uh, that we bring into the United States with us, uh, whether consciously or unconsciously, uh, than many others would like to admit. Uh, the personal part of this is that I am Afro-Latina. Uh, my mother uh, is a descendant of slaves, as am I. Um, and it was not easy for her, much easier for me, because she was racially conscious uh, and uh, tried to give me um, a strong sense of race pride and self-esteem. Um, but that was something she had to fight for. Um, the book tells a little bit more about that. I'm not going to reveal it so that you have some <laughs> surprise to look at. Um, but the, the bottom line is this. Um, the um, hypocrisy and the duality of um, Latino racial attitudes uh, is something that I grew up with, meaning I like to say we, we speak about this out of two sides of our mouths, right? You know, out of one side, um, we say we are racially evolved. You know, we are much more... Um, racially mixed than in the United States, but of course, erases all the shades that exist within the United States, like, you know, like we own race mixture. But in any case, um, that we are more racially mixed within uh, uh, our Latin American and Caribbean uh, communities, and that means that we are then um, impervious uh, to racial discrimination, you know, that that doesn't exist simply because uh, we are all a uh, multi-hued, uh, multi uh, colored rainbow. Uh -huh. And then on the other side of our mouths, at the very, you know, almost in the same breath, all in the same sentence, right, uh, will be the most pejorative anti black attitudes flowing out of the mouths of Latinos, of all shades, right? um, but nevertheless a very deep, deep, deep part of our uh, communities, you know. Uh, if you've ever studied a foreign language or romance language, you will know that um, gender is deeply implicated within our language. Like every object has a gender. <laughs> you know, a pen has a gender. A computer has a gender. Well, just as deep as how we gender our language in Spanish uh, are our racial notions about where blackness belongs, where it doesn't belong, uh, who has capacity, who does not. You know, the pathologies right, of a racial system are all very much part of what we sort of enter into the United States with or have long had here over generations and generations right, of presence here. Um, so how does that bring me then to the topic of the book, right? Uh, I am a lawyer, uh, and what I wanted to do was to pierce uh, this taboo and often uh, mischaracterized situation of uh, Latino racial attitudes. Uh, the idea that, oh, you know, I don't really see it. It's not, not as serious as what, you know, otherwise exists in the United States. Or, um, well, you know, we may be prejudiced, but we're not racist because we don't have power. That's a refrain uh, that is often parlayed, right? Um, and the thing, here's the thing. When you look and you want to illuminate the stories of people who are victims of discrimination, and the book purposely brings together Afro-Latino, African-American, Africans, and other people from the African diaspora, all of them together giving voice to their experiences of discrimination at the hands of people who are Latino, right? um, who may or not identify in a particular uh, uh, w w w way f uh, racially. Uh, and when you look at their stories, what becomes very crystal clear is that it's not just an innocuous attitude, that it's not just about, here's the other question, I'll forget, maybe I'm supplanting your questions during the Q&A, but 
then we can talk about something else if you don't want to. Um, uh, the, the other question I often get is, oh, is this just colorism? Is this just about aesthetics, you know, who we like to marry and who we like to date, which is, you know, kind of not nice when you won't look at the whole spectrum of humanity, but that's not so serious, is it really? The way in which, you know, Jim Crow segregation has been? Well, when you take those attitudes and then you marry them to actions, actions that exclude right, and obstruct and harm physically harm and also kill people based on their racial background, right, on their uh, African ancestry within Latinidad, well then that's no longer just an innocuous uh, attitude of, um, you know, oh I like some colors and I don't like others, you know, and those who I want to date and so I don't want to date, etc. Uh, so what the book does is it says, you know, Latinos are often said that they don't understand racism, at least not like in the United States. That, that's we're, Hence the title of the book. We're racially innocent. That's a U.S. thing. That's not our thing. When we come to the United States, that's when we discover that there's this horrible thing called racism, and it's a very U.S.-made um, product. Uh, when in point of fact, we've been doing it, doing it good, doing it a long time within Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, um, and this also all pertains to, I'm trying to like give this huge nutshell of the book, um, the ways in which people who have never even been to Latin America and the Caribbean, right? So, you know, generations and generations are those who never had to have families move because America came to them, right? You know, I'm talking about California, New Mexico, et cetera, uh, which were, you know, long Latino before the U.S. showed up and then claimed it as U.S. territories. So in any case, all of this right, is a way in which Latinos often say we don't understand racism, right? not like in the US, but they become very coherent when they experience discrimination or observe a loved one experience discrimination. When they come into court, when they file complaints, they speak the language right, of racism. Right? They un it becomes clearer. Mm -hmm. right? So the bottom line is this. The book is really just a bunch of stories right, in many ways. Right? It, it's a lifting up people's stories uh, and trying to show the patterns, the problematic patterns, and the ways in which Latinos are complicit um, in issues of anti-blackness and discrimination. Uh, but the stories are not just, oh, this is an interesting thing that happened to me on the way to the supermarket. Right? Um, these are all stories that are tantamount to sort of building a picture that we don't normally never see. Um, and that's the way in which racial hierarchy exists within communities of color, and that the racial hierarchy is a serious barrier to equality. Right? Often I'm told, oh, can't we like all come together? Can't we like Rodney King this thing and uh, you know, be in coalition? And, you know, that's beautiful. I think that's a beautiful picture. Don't get me wrong. Right? Uh, but how can you come together and be in coalition while within your own community you are busy enacting, manifesting anti-blackness and racial exclusion. So a uh, uh, quick sum up so that I can like hear from my readers and we can like go at it with each other with, <laughs> and then you all can join in, uh, is a looking at sort of systematically, where do these stories come up within the employment context? Where do they come up within the educational context? I'd say that that, that chapter hurt me, hurt my heart the most. Because um, you know, to see young children experiencing this, um, at the hands of Latino educators and Latino school administrators, that was very hard. Um, in public accommodations, you know, Latinos like to create white Latino spaces. Right? Um, we reenact um, our uh, white spaces from the Caribbean and Latin America. Uh, and so when we get in control, um, if we're not particularly woke, <laughs> we then have barriers, right? So a velvet rope, but not so velvety. Uh, in which you are not allowed access based on your ancestry. Right? Um, whether you work at a Denny's, I've got stories about Denny's in there, um, or, <laughs> or a high fine uh, restaurant um, in Puerto Rico. It's, like, it's part of the United States, so I brought it into the story as well. Um, I also look at the criminal justice system, um, and I'm losing track. Yeah, I think, I think those were all the venues, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because what I wanted to do was to show the places in which anti-discrimination law speaks and thus the story of 
uh, Latino anti-blackness is manifest and made um, much more concrete. Not to say that law is perfect. I'm not one of these like, oh, we do such a great job in law. The book also looks at how, because of these mischaracterizations of Latino racial attitudes and actions, uh, judges and lawyers and other legal stakeholders often get it wrong, right? They buy the hype, right? They think, oh, well, you know, how could they be? This is a defensive discrimination to say that you are Latino, that your Latino-ness like, makes you an impossible actor uh, in the, in actions of anti-discrimination. And some of these cases do not go well because of it. So the book is hopefully like a curative or at least a wake-up call um, for my fellow uh, you know, legal uh, stakeholder uh, members. But it's not written just for them. It's written for Afro-Latino activists um, who you'll hear from. Um, it's written for anyone who cares about um, racial equality uh, and, and a better world. Um, that seems like very highfalutin of me to say, but it's, it was, uh, it's my honest uh, truth. It's like, you know, what the um, uh, motivations uh, for the book were. Um, so I think I kind of like said a lot, um, and I'll probably keep saying more, because um, we're just gonna have like a free-flowing conversation, um, but, but I'll let Tania like, you know, guide us so I don't like take things over. Thank you so much for that, for sharing um, about your book. I, I came out here and I was like, let's go, because I mean, I would normally just be in the audience listening to you because this is a subject that um, obviously you know I'm very interested in. Um, so I didn't thank you all for coming, so thank you all for coming. And those of you tuning in from Internet World, thank you for, for tuning in. And um, we are here with a wonderful esteemed panel and uh, now that Tanya has uh, provided some context for the book, we're going to just hear a little bit from each of our panelists, some thoughts, comments. Hi, my name is Manuel again. Um, I am the chair of the DC Afro Latino Caucus. No, porque ahí tengo mi nota. Y quiero recordar lo que quiero decir. Thank you for coming. Uh, I am the chair of the DC Afro Latino Caucus, an organization that that um, advocates for Afro Latinos here in in the DMV. And one of the things that um, really surprised me about the book that I, no le conté porque quería preguntarle a usted is the the reason why or why hasn't Univision or Telemundo been sued? Mm. <laughs> It just, uh, it just, it, it, as I was reading the book, as, as, as I was reading the book and going through it and thinking about how we Latinos, uh, unquote, um, gain or uh, 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 gain whiteness, like to, to, to be, to, to, to have the, 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 Queremos pelos, pelo, cre no, no queremos pelo crespo, queremos pelo bien eh, liso, bueno. Um, so Good how, hair, bad hair debate. How television, how television and how Univision and Telemundo really have, um, yeah, perpetuated those things to yeah. our community and the reasons why they really haven't been sued. And yeah. what is it that we need to do? the activist com community, the lawyers, to, m to, to make this happen. I mean, because we talk about content. We're talking about folks who content create. They need more content creators. But at a certain point, it's like, how are you cultivating those content creators who, I, I, I don't believe that there is no content, black Latino content creators that, that, that are not creating this, this content, right? Um, so what, I'm trying to frame the question because it's like it's unbelievable that they haven't been sued. And yeah, you know, okay. 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 <laughs> in as I see it, part of the problem, right, is that there is a great buy-in from our community about those aspirational visions, right? Um, you know, the telenovelas and and every and uh, you know, it's, uh, Latin television is bigger than just the, tele, the, the telenovelas, but you know, to start there, they're an easy target, so. Um, is that, you know, everything is beautiful, the girl gets the boy in the end, he's always rich. Um, and, 
you know, you get to escape your world for a little while, right? And so it is a, um, it's like McDonald's, y'all, right? It, we all know it's not good for us, right? But man, it's hard to pass up those French fries. Right? Uh, and it's going to be difficult to try to shake that. Now, years ago, the Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund, before it became Latino Justice, uh, had really been thinking long and hard about ways in which to try to do the lawsuit um, against one of them. I'm not which. I'm not sure which one, of, if they were going to go after all of them. Um, and I'm not sure what it was that made them think from the legal perspective that it might not be um, a productive uh, use of their time, although they were really thinking about it for quite some time. Uh, but I think that part of it was this difficulty of, oh, but we're giving the public what they want. Mm -hmm. right? um, oh, we don't control right what it is people are asking for or what it is that the content provides. Now that's a weak excuse. I agree, right? But as far as like the legalities of it, if you see, um, it's sort of hard to kind of put them on the hook for something they specifically did wrong. Now, this is DC, so I'm sure there's some other lawyers in the room. Um, and so during the Q&A, you can please um, elaborate further as to what, you know, whether I got this right or wrong. But those are my intuitions about it. And, you know, I'm happy to hear what, what you have to say, too. But, you know, see you. No, I mean, I could, I have oh, lots of questions. Oh, I see what you're doing. Round Robin, okay. That, that's, that's fair. That's fair. Well, so, uh, so it's wonderful to see all of you uh, here. And Robin. This is what the mic is for. I, I can't drop it. Uh, so it, it's wonderful to see you all here. Uh, and as I said before, it's it's great to have my friends' work, um, you know, to share it with all of you and to know that other people around the country. Oh, it might not. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, to see that her work is being appreciated. The lawyer in me, or the, the law professor in me, just has to underscore what it took to put together uh, this book, and particularly the stories and the legal uh, materials that were uh, uh, um, underneath all the stories that you saw. I mean, it takes so much painstaking work uh, to do that, and it's you're not, you're, you're not playing your, your lawyer hat right now, but it will be the foundation for the kinds of uh, challenges that you're talking about, which is, it, it, it is fantastic. So I wanna thank her for that, and I think I read a very early draft years ago, and so it's even more um, uh, gratifying to, to see it. Um, I wanted to just put, on a, put out for conversation later on, um, a, a personal story of mine uh, that has to do with my father who was not connected to his family in, in Puerto Rico um, much at all, but he did go visit them. Uh, and there were, you know, in the, in the um, hills, um, all Afro-Latino, um, very poor. Um, and I, I raise it because that's not who we're talking about when we're looking at the, at the news at all. Um, and I also am raising it because I want to, I hope that we can get to a point in our conversation where we talk about where do we go with the knowledge that we now have because of Tanya? What could we do differently? Where could we um, organize differently? Where could we reach out uh, differently? Um, and I think that, I think those are questions, especially, I shouldn't maybe not talk about the the midterms, but they're coming up. Uh, and um, one of the, the things that I find um, difficult is not only the, the bias that you see in, in some of the conversations, some of the, the films, all of that, but also um, they're not getting very much for all of that. It is, it is like having a, a, har a hamburger, right? After a while, then it's not working with you. Um, and so part of what I want to explore and get Tanya's thoughts are is how do we move forward just beyond the, 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 the candy of whiteness so that we are really thinking about, and, and the work that she does on structural inequality in the book is, is perfect, spot on, and can be something that we raise for groups who are happy now with just their little piece of the pie. What if we get a bigger 
piece of the pie and what that would mean if you uh, rely on the kinds of relationships um, that Tanya make, you know, sets out in the book. So you have a you have an Afro Latino and a, a, a friend who's not Afro Latino who comes in and backs her up. What does that look like? So an African American woman doing that. Those are the kinds of things that I think are possible once we um, embrace the kinds of um, insights that that Tanya shared with us. Mm. Awesome. Well, I'll hop in. Uh, hello, everyone. Again, I'm Justin Hansford. I'm a law professor at Howard University, director of our Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center, and I'm also a lifelong critical race theorist. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the critical race theory element of this piece. I know that we're in a safe space here to talk about critical race theory. That's not true everywhere in, in our country right now, but Tanya is also as someone who is a critical race theorist, I think it's safe to say. Yep, certainly. So we get out ourselves here. We we are uh, part of this project that's been been in, engaging the public on critical race theory over the past two summers, called the Critical Race Theory Summer School, which is online. If you Google it, um, it's put on by the African American Policy Forum, and there are, I think, over fifty or sixty different sessions that are available for download on critical race theory for people who want to know more about what critical race theory actually is as opposed to what they say it is. But this, this book is, to me, a breakthrough in the field of critical race theory because it helps us to understand how race functions when it comes to, um, you could say, intra-minority, if the term, the, sort of a weird term, uh, around, around race and how it works in the United States uh, between different minority groups. Now, traditionally, as critical race theorists, we relied on this concept, call, concept called the racial bribe. The racial bribe is this concept, and of course, Tanya's a, a bigger expert on it than me, so she can correct me if I say it incorrectly. But the racial bribe essentially is this concept where for many years we assumed that the presence of racism in immigrant communities against black people in particular, anti-black racism, was part of a bribe system. This idea that, that you can get closer to whiteness if you say along with us that, oh, these black people are lazy, don't work hard, into unintelligent, whatever. So it's a bribe. And if you take the bribe, you can be accepted into the political community. And you could, you could marry in. You could have, you could have a essentially anti non discriminated against life <laughs> in the United States if you take this racial bribe. So that's how we explained the presence of racism amongst minority groups. And you, know, you can you know there's so many examples in um, our politics you think about from the George Zimmerman to you know the chairman of the Proud Boys who's Cuban to Officer Encino, we think about Sandra Bland. So there's so many instances where we see it play out in real time. And as critical race theorists, we were trying to explain how this takes place when, you know, politically in the past, we've had black brown coalitions, we've had the brown berets, you had uh, you know, people who were organizing for many years to try to make the argument that, uh, you know, there's a political identity called Chicanos and, you know, people who were trying to make the argument that you are also part of an anti-colonial project an anti-empire project as someone who is a brown person here in this hemisphere fighting against the same system of white supremacy. White supremacy affects you as a, a Latino. So how do we explain the presence of racism in those communities? What Tanya is able to do with her, under, with her concept of uh, you know, the rhetoric of racial innocence is help us to understand that, no, this is not always a racial bribe that's being taken. Sometimes people are coming from their home countries, mother countries, and the racial hierarchies that are playing out in that country are still with them as from, from a cultural perspective. So the inequalities we see in Colombia, I just got back from Colombia, huge victory. There's a wonderful Afro-Colombian vice president who is a longtime activist. Yeah, Francia Marquez, give her a round of applause. I'm so excited about her. Uh, project and she is inaugurating 
a reparations commission in Colombia. And she is talking about the historical discrimination that she as a, a dark-skinned Afro-Colombian has experienced on her way towards the vice presidency. So these, so it's, it's an example of the racial hierarchies that are experienced in Puerto Rico and Mexico and all these different places. And those racial hierarchies are imported in, in a sense or brought over and they continue to play out in the families and the communities and the consciousness of people who are now um, part of the American community. So it's not necessarily a racial bribe that's being taken always. Sometimes it is a carryover from historical culture. Now that, that raises a lot of questions, right? So how do we fight those racial hierarchies in that sense? Uh, because these are different, they're playing out in different contexts. Maybe it's more colorism, maybe you know, there's a different history around some of the stereotypes. So I guess my question for you, Tanya, would be, how, did, how does your in, insight here on the rhetoric of racial innocence, you know, change the way that we respond to intra-minority uh, racial attacks as opposed to b before your book where we had one strategy, which was to say, you know, don't, don't take up this, this racial bribe. Don't take the bribe, right? So if it's not a bribe that's going on, and, if, and it's an it's a importation of tradition, you know, some people may have his, in their families traditional uh, materials where there are, there may be blackface in their, uh, their books from the 50s or 60s. You know, so, so how do we attack racial hierarchies that are brought over from traditions from the mother country as opposed to being racial bribes being taken? Well, you know, that, for me that brings up two ideas that I want to make sure I articulate. Hopefully I, I won't, I'll remember number two by the time I say number one. Um, one is that I often talk about like, you know, we come to the United States and we have our bags and that we don't just bring our clothes in our luggage, right? You know, we bring all our other sort of cultural tropes and I attitudes and that includes not just like what we eat, what we drink, what the music and the dancing, right? It's also our racial attitudes. But the additional layer I wanted to uh, put on to this is that I'm not just talking about, this is not just an immigration story, right? This is, right, it's in part one, but it's not solely one, right? Um, it's not just generational, meaning, cuando se acaban los viejos, when the old people die with their bad attitudes, then this will all be finished, right? <laughs> um, no, right? Because this is something that gets taught over and over and over again, right? Um, there's one point in the book, I don't want to say too much because I want you to read it, but there's one point in the book where I go into housing discrimination, right? Um, and I tell the story um, of people who experience housing discrimination in Florida, <laughs> but I'm just picking on Florida. All the United States is encompassed within the book, um, but there's that one story. Uh, and the experience that this woman experiences of being precluded from access to uh, housing um, we, uh, Latinos barring her way because uh, she is Afro-Latina is happening in the 1940s and 50s and then the very same dynamic, the very same way she tells the story happens again later in the 2000s, right? So this is not just, oh, new people. It's not just old people. It is a unfortunate, just like we teach our young people Spanish, right? We want them to eat our food, but what, right? These things keep being passed down. Um, so that's point number one. Point number two is that, I can't believe I forgot to say this, but even the title of the book, uh, The Racial Innocence, um, it's more like a sequel or, you know, like a good science fiction, a trilogy. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> so this book, right, and the lead up, that's why Robin says this book was a long time coming, right? Because she's been with me on this journey from the very beginning. Happily. Uh, happily, happily. She's <laughs> you got a sister friend. Um, so the idea about racial innocence comes from looking at global anti-blackness, right? Um, when you talked about being in Colombia, right? That work was work that I was looking at for book number one, right, of this trilogy. That, I don't want to say too much about because I want to talk about this book, but okay. Uh, racial subordination in Latin America, boom, I said it. So that was, book vo that was volume number one in the trilogy. Um, and th what that was all about was the way in which this idea of racial innocence, we're not the racist, is los americanos, the Americans, meaning North Americans, never us, right? We are innocent here. We didn't have Jim Crow segregation. That book unveils the way in which we may not have called it that, 
but we effectuated it in just the same way. Right? So that's volume number one. Volume number two looks at the United States and the ways in which in multiracials and civil rights, mixed race stories of discrimination, part two looked at how these ideas of racial innocence and mixed race in the United States, not just Latinos, but all the ideas behind, oh, we will racially evolve when everybody's racially mixed. We can we don't do nothing else. We don't have to have a civil rights movement. We don't have to have reparations. We don't have to have anything else. We just need people to come together and have beautiful families. I mean, that's a great thing, but that doesn't solve racism. Look back at volume number one, all right? <laughs> oh, which was the racial subordination in Latin America. Volume three, racial innocence, was about taking together these ideas of sort of piercing the veil of uh, mixed race rhetoric as salvation. They came in book number two. Um, and how in Latin America, the uh, conversation in some respects is maybe some might say a little bit more evolved, right? The anti-blackness has generated a civil rights regional movement, right? So Colombia talks to Brazil, Brazil talks to Mexico, Mexico talks to Venezuela. Yes, I know, but okay. Uh, and uh, <laughs> they all talk to each other, right, as part of regional uh, diasporic movements of afro descendiente afro descendants right you don't have to say you're black but you do have to say you're part of blackness right um and so we get beyond people sort of like learned be, uh, behavioral rejection of blackness although we encourage that identification as well oh, i say all that to say this that in response to justice's question the way forward if it's not just about racial bribe if it's about all of these other legacies that you know walk into the door, right? It, the answer is also within the way in which I think global anti-black movements, right? Um, or I should say, the anti of the anti-blackness, racial equality movements, for better stated, right? um, within Latin America, um, are really generating greater sense of Afro-Latinidad in the United States. I mean. When people say, oh, well, you know, this is new, this thing of calling yourself an Afro-Latino. Like, why are you saying that now? I hear a lot of that, too. Um, it's not just here, right? It's within the region. <laughs> within the region and in the Caribbean, right, uh, there is this greater growing sense, right? So often people say to me, oh, well, you know, in the Dominican Republic, people don't want to say that they are black. Well, there might be some people, but that's not the whole place. Right? That's not obviously all of Hispaniola. Um, there are people who racially identify as black, have black pride, and are part of the conversation and the energy behind thinking about global anti-blackness, and in particular, the, these ideas of how um, the excuses that get made, oh, that's not about racism, it's about class. That's not about racism, that's about cultural differentiation. You know, we don't have anything against African Americans. It's just that they don't understand us, and so we don't understand them. It's always about something else. The reason the, I, in the book I bring together the Afro Latino, African American, African, and other African Afro diasporic spaces, you know, people who identify as West Indian, et cetera, and they all take in heat from Latinos on based on, um, based on anti blackness. I talk faster, the more excited I get. Is because I wanted to dispel those excuses that it's always about something else when you see the pattern across these um, different demographic spaces of blackness it gets harder to say oh it's just a cultural misunderstanding oh it's just about socioeconomic status I got plenty of data in the book also that talks about the ways in which when you control for socioeconomic status race is still an actual factor meaning that anti-blackness is operating bueno. Oh, just don't let them know. Wow. No, no, that's bueno el tema. Hasta las seis. Ok, pero una preguntita corta, corta, corta. Is, because I went a rabbit hole in terms of like eugenics in Latin America, because that, 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 that existed uh, in the 19, in the 1900s. Um, pero para, para mí, um, it was important that you looked at um, Miami mm -hmm. and how white Cubans 
um, are looked at a certain certain way in Latinidad. Mm. Um, so could you talk to me a, a little bit about that? Pero la otra, del otro lado that you talked to uh, a, a lot was the gang cultures in L.A. Mm -hmm. and, and their, their, their uh, fights with African-American communities and displacement in different areas in, in L.A. That's a lot to take on in the last couple seconds before, <laughs> <laughs> before Brad brings out the hook and tells us, okay, uh, time for the audience to talk. Um, but here's what I can say, right? I wanted for the book to be rich, not just in all the different kinds of Latinos, right? You know, so we, I, I talk about the West Coast, the East Coast, you know, uh, uh, and also about the ways in which um, the regional specificity, right? It matters, right? You know, New York is not Miami. Miami is not Iowa. Yes, Iowa is in the book, right? Um, right? Because if there's a case, I tracked it, right? Um, and when, you know, I was talking back to what Robin was saying earlier, how, you know, how hard it was to get out. It's because within law, we don't tabulate um, the race of the person who is accused of the discrimination, right? Um, and so, you know, if you suing the employer for discrimination, and it happens to be, well, if you read the LA Times this week, you will know, right? There's big, these big lawsuits out that EEOC brought, um, in which it was like, you know, black anti-blackness is operating within these um, factories uh, on the assembly floor in uh, uh, California, but only until a reporter dug it out did we find out in her in her interviews of the employees that all the anti-blackness they were hearing was in Espanol, mm. right? From their fellow employees, uh, their co-workers, but who were Latino, right? So meaning like, there's a deeper story there, but you don't get it just from looking at the, the court record. You gotta like get do all the extra work. Um, and so I will just simply say that the regional specificities <coughs> matter, but at the same time, the overarching pattern is really what I wanted to bring to the fore. Like meaning that I'm not here to just say, I am Miami, esa gente, right? You know, I'm not just here to pick on any particular space because when when that happens, then we get to conveniently take our eye off of every other place, right? Uh, and uh, make it, and this is a very Latino kind of uh, dynamic, right? Just like blackness is always someplace else, you know, in Puerto Rico, it's in Luis Aldea, right? You know. Um, in Colombia, it's in Cartagena. It's no place else, right? nobody else. Right? Uh, we also do that with respect to issues of when there are problems. It's an individual, it's never about a group. It's an individual in one specific location, it's never about anywhere else. Right? So this is why um, some might say, oh, well, you know, you took on too much uh, in the book. Well, you know, okay, dream big, right? Uh, dream big or go home. Um, but I also wanted to be able to kind of really bring home how much is encompassed um, within uh, this topic. Thank you so much, Sheila. Um, uh, no, okay, I think, I think we're gonna move on to questions from you all, because I feel like we probably have a lot. Because <laughs> um, my wheels are turning right now. I'm really glad that Justin brought up <laughs> Columbia, because that's where I am doing so much stuff and everything that's happened in Colombia and I also think about Brazil and think about all of these all of these issues living very vibrant lives in those countries, the anti blackness and not really, you know, realizing and so not being surprised that this is what is this is what happens when people get here. I mean the institution of slavery, as you mentioned in the beginning went more there than here. And so, of course, when people come here, why wouldn't they bring all of those things with them? And um, it, lives, it lives on very, very deeply. Um, so there's a, if you would like to ask a question, there is a microphone here next to the pillar. I would ask you to please come and stand up because this is being live streamed and so people will need to hear your voices well, on you the microphone. Stand. Oh, and if you need to stand, stand, you can, you can bring it. Oh, yes, we can bring a mic to you, too, if you want. No, no, no. Oh. Maybe another mic. Oh, I think 
I want you to touch on uh, the racism from the African American towards the Afro Latina or Afro Latino. Can you touch on that? We've been looking at this for about 15 years. <laughs> okay. So. I think a question you're probably much too polite to ask, so I'm going to put it on the table as a, a partner to your question. Right? Um, the other question I often get asked is, well, you know, that's all well and good, Hernandez, uh, but, <laughs> I think I've just said it, uh, but what about all that racism from the African Americans towards the Latinos and the Afro Latinos, right? Why are you talking about that? Uh, oh, first, I would say, you know, one racism doesn't excuse another racism. <laughs> um, uh, the other thing, I would, uh, um, before I get to your question, right, is that I wanted the book to make a contribution. And what there's lots and lots and lots of um, ink spilled on pages on is all the pathologies of African Americans and how they don't like immigrants and they don't want this and blah, blah, blah. Right? Meaning there's lots of stuff out there. Right? The, the news is very attuned right, uh, to covering right, the way in which African Americans are sort of the problem with regards to any other groups. Right? It's never about our racially segmented society, our own forms of nativism. No, no, no. It's always like the African American is the problem. Right? Um, so for me, there's some form of anti-blackness in that coverage, right? and I didn't want to be part of that. But the other thing that I would say is the dynamics right, with regards to uh, as uh, Justin was referring to it, sort of like intra-racial, intra-community, uh, racial dynamics, is also, I think, because we, like so many others in the United States and elsewhere, like, are racially illiterate. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that to be judgmental, right? I mean, I mean it literally. We are racially illiterate. We are not taught right, anything about the way in which there are Afro-Latinos who exist, right? Um, so... African Americans are just as much the victims of our illiteracy in the United States. Um, and so to the extent that they sometimes have shock and surprise, like, oh, there are black people who speak French, there are black people who speak, right? you know, like that there are black people beyond the black people here in the United States, that's often surprising. And that's because it's not taught in school, right? And so, and it's not in part of the media, et cetera. So that racial illiteracy, I think, feeds into um, some of the dynamics that are problematic, right? Even within blackness, right? Um, I also think that there's a way, ways in which within the African American community, right? Not part of it too, uh, is there is a, a a fear often, right? About when other people will say that they are black for strategic purpose, right? And that, I'm not saying Afro Latinos do that, although we have seen all kinds of crazy with people sort of putting on blackface in mm -hmm. order. Uh, anyway, uh, Leslie and I, like, I go all, all kinds of rabbit holes here. Right? There's, there's so much to talk about. Right? But the point is this. I think that there's um, a well-founded fear often of people outside African-American communities talking about blackness, and they're, f they're fearful that it's going to mean further subordination and not true allyship and not true mutual identification. I'm not saying any of that is excusing. I think it's also part of the the racial literacy that we are all victims of, right? And so the book, plug, 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 right, is part of trying to um, help ameliorate that paucity of literacy, right, to make us more racially literate in order, right? right that, how do we deal with the midterm elections and all these other issues, right? Is we need many more people having a better understanding about so the why of where we are and how we interact with each other. Thank you. Bueno. <laughs> you know, I like the fact that when my name is mentioned that people sort of panic about <laughs> the type of question that I am going to ask. First of all, I want to say that I'm extremely proud that my sister Tonija, Manuel, Tanya are here because you have done extremely well in advancing the interests of Afro-Latinos for many, many years. 
Okay, so the applause is well welcome. I depart from the premise that all of <laughs> Central Caribbean and South American countries are racist. So my question is this, what sort of strategies do you propose for us Afro-Latinos that are fighting this constant wave of racism we should do in order to mitigate that level of subtle racism that exists in the U.S. Because many of these individuals, I'm talking about white Hispanics that have been involved in promoting racism in their countries and then they come to the U.S. and in a very, very subtle way they manifest that racism but it's sort of sneaky. Now, my strategy is to be very militant in mitigating that wave of racism. But since I'm of old age, I'm trying to be suave, <laughs> and I would like to hear from you what strategies should I develop in order to expose and mitigate that wave of racism that is very much present, especially now when many Hispanics are gravitating toward the Republican Party that, according to Biden, is a fascist orientation. So I ask the question, what sort of guidance can you give this humble servant? And don't get confused with the outfit. I was at a wedding. <laughs> And that's the reason why Sylvia and I are dressed this way. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have been with my guayabera, my pantaloncitos, and my chancletas, etc. So, that's my question. How do you encourage Roland Roebuck to be suave in his approach towards Hispanic racism towards Afro-Latinos? And I want to recognize that we have here some also advocates. We have David Street, we have Judith Morrison, and some other advocates that have done a lot of work. So, that's my preguntita. <laughs> preguntita <laughs> nada. Uh, uh, okay, so two points. I always, I always seem to have two points. Two points. Um, the book is not focused on the subtle racism, just to be very clear, right? Um, the book is focused on it is straight up when you see it you will understand you, you won't be confused etc for I'll give you one other quick example all right um, in one of the housing cases um, not a Miami one I'll use a New York one so that you know no one feels picked on um, owner of a home selling right? well I got an owner of a home and I got a sell I got a couple stories but anyway uh, let me pick one Someone renting an apartment. Afro Latino comes to rent. Told the usual housing story. No, no, no longer available. Sorry, etc. The Afro Latino has got friends. Does his own sort of test case. Sends somebody white looking. Now that same apartment is available. All right, that's one. And goes further. Homeowner says, "I want to put the house on for sale." Black person comes up, comes to buy it. That Latino homeowner says, no, no, not from you. Huh? Leaves the house on the market another three months. Mm. All right? That you, anyone a homeowner knows, that's a loss. All right? If you, when you want to sell and you want to get out from under and not keep paying the mortgage, et cetera, right? rather would take the financial hit mm. right, than to sell it to someone of African ancestry. Waited another three months, right? Um, so the book... Point number one is not about subtlety, right? You know, one could certainly get into that, but I wanted to like first we talk about what's not subtle, right? But isn't identified as such that it's not part of the problem of racism, right? Secondarily, right? In focusing on these issues of like the explicit, part of my um, 
I guess, advocacy or advice, I'm trying to think of the best way to characterize this, um, is to urge hmm. that the reader, <laughs> once sort of exposed to this information or otherwise already knowing it, having greater sense of validation uh, and like source material within which to bring forth stuff they already long knew, but for those who for it's new for them, good for you, right? Um, to then ha be, have the ability to use that to be able to um, disassemble all the excuses that are presented about how Latinos are part, uh, are, are part of racism, right? So the one, oh, I can't possibly be racist because I am Latino. Well, no, these things are not mutually exclusive, all right? Um, uh, oh, I can't possibly be racist because I experience racism. Well, that's unfortunately true, right? That there's discrimination against Latinos. Right, now that, that like my mother's experienced discrimination simply because she picked up a phone. No one saw her face. Right, they didn't know she was Afro Latina, but they heard the last name. Right, the Spanish surname. They probably thought they heard an accent that she's a New Yorker. In any case, right? so there is discrimination, right, ba against people just based on their Latino background. It's true, but again, these things are not mutually exclusive. Right, and so my. Uh, uh, tools, if you will, right, in part uh, to answer the distinguished uh, Don Robic, right, um, is to say that um, the, I don't know if it's a way to do it suavemente, but it's uh, um, definitely a way in which to have a greater arsenal within which to pierce through the way in which the discrimination of Latinos is dismissed and or otherwise seen as invisible, or say, or, or, so, that's not seen, it's, it's not seen. This is a way in which to be able to pull that apart and then be able to have a way to address it and have everybody be part of the pro part of the solution just like I, the, like I don't know if I end the book this way but I think I do um, had multiple endings in mind but one of them is like you know where Latinos have been part of the problem we when we recognize that we can also be part of the solution right so it's not just a finger wagging kind of a book you know it's meant to be we we can't come together we can't ride and king this thing <laughs> Thank you for that, that was awesome. All of it has been awesome. I'm Stacy Speller, I'm a second year PhD student at Howard University studying higher education leadership and policy studies. And a lot of my research focuses on um, Latinidad, particularly Afro-Latinidad and um, historically black colleges and universities and how HBCUs can be the solution. Right, Roland? And so, um, that's kind of where I want to go with my dissertation. And so this book, when it came out, the title was just like, this is the prerequisite to how I'm going to get this argument across. Um, and so, you know, being a New Yorican, and that's really a thing, right? A, a, a native New Yorker born by or raised by two Puerto Rican parents and having seen the black and brown coalition, right? And then having received my undergraduate and master's degree from Bethune Cookman in the South, and then seeing blackness there and you know kind of being discriminated as a Puerto Rican or New Rican in the south you know from what i thought was black and brown coalition because my idea of black and brown was one and the same being from New York and then seeing something different in the south was like whoa right it hit me like a like a ball of fire but made me feel like it's something that i want to make my lifelong mission and so in this program now um, you know I see a solution, and I can be your 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 young tigre to, to go out there and fight for you because um, that's what I want my dissertation to do. And so I see solution in our historically black colleges and universities where we have curriculum that speaks to Afro-Latinos, right? And that where these spaces are incubators for our Afro-Latinos, right? They should be, but I've been to two HBCUs so far, and they really have not shown that. Right, And so how do we create that coalition within these institutions that were socially made from racism, right? And how do we not show the, the divisiveness that I know was where your question was coming from? Because I have a ton of Latino friends that go to these HBCUs and don't feel welcomed, right? And so um, that's a problem. And so um, needless to say, thank you so much for your contribution. You know, just being in this space. And um, thank you to everyone for being here because I believe that it starts with education. That's that's the solution, yeah. Dunia, would, would you be willing to step in on this issue? Because I think you have a lot to offer here. Dunia. Well, this is 
semester in Daisy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we talk about this all the time. Yeah. And, and actually, as a kind of at the root of this, we actually had a panel last year. Last year, my one was on it. Um, our Elijah back here was the moderator. I mean, we're all well represented in the room today. Mm -hmm. And part of it was, you know, a conversation at HBCUs at Howard in particular, talking about some of our students who are Afro-Latino having to pick one or the other, usually the black, over the Latino, so that none of that happens. And that's not okay. And so, but then, you know, you have Howard and other HBCUs that are represent the full diaspora, the full African diaspora present, but you still have the subsections. You have the folks from Jamaica, Trinidad over here, you have the Africans over here, and everybody's in their little subgroup. And uh, to your point of racial illiteracy, it's like we're, mm, it isn't always like how ta describes it on the yard in the springtime. Yeah. And I w maybe it was once upon a time, yeah. <laughs> I think it might have. I think it was like that once upon a time, but I feel like something has shifted, and we need to get we need to get back to that space. And so, trying to you know have our students at the Bunch Center, we send our students out on study abroad. I think that's a huge part of what needs to happen, so that our students can understand really what it looks like beyond the borders of their town. Because even coming to Washington D.C. for some of our students is a big deal how out of the, beyond the borders of their town and beyond the borders of this country to see what else is out there and how it, how it impacts and relates to them. So I agree, there's a lot of work that HBCUs need to do. That's what I'm doing my dissertation on. So anyway, <laughs> you can read about that in a year. Okay. <laughs> Hello. No, no me necesitan micrófono. Necesitan. Okay. Um, I work in Word 8 and Word 7. And I believe that everything starts with education. Yo voy a hablar en Spanglish, okay? Yeah. So I'm from San Pedro, and I connect more with my youth and families from where seven and eight because I come from such a poor background, both in San Pedro and here. I was a poor black immigrant with my family, right? It's hard for me to, like, creer que la... El problema en América con la división es una inocencia racial, right? I have this whole theme this year. I left the school that I was at. I went to work with kids that were considered more problematic. 97% um, black, African American. I show them the beauty of maintaining your innocence. So los ABCU de aquí de este país tienen que comenzar a, a ir a las high schools. I feel like our black children, I have maybe three teens get killed this summer. Gun violence. I rarely see black folks with money from uptown in worth seven and eight. The same, this is the same thing in San Pedro, right? I wanna make um, a little virtual school, I'm working on that, so I can teach my kids that look like me. Porque en San Pedro también es clase y raza. But I'm like, when you make it, out of the hood or el barrio, yo soy de la arena. Like the police is not even allowed to get in my hood where I'm from, you know? And it saddens me that I connect sometimes more with my students with the fact that I was also part of a neglected community within a community uh, raised, a group of people that were already neglected, you know? So I'm, I love what y'all are doing. I love it. Um, my whole theme is keeping the innocence of the black child. But I'm like, how do we present that to them? Because I get in front of my kids sometimes, and they're like, oh, pero Mara la Negra tiene dinero. Oh, but so and so. But I don't see a Mara la Negra either in the hood. So how, I don't know, like, I don't know how to connect um, books they want, like the one you guys have to my kids fully without telling them, well, yeah, you know, they were they were from the hood before and now they got money. But how do I say, you can you can DM them, you can talk to them, they're reachable. There's a lot of black people that make their money and they don't go back. Yeah. In DC, it's disgusting. DC is disgusting. I have so many families that they tell me, um, I have a black representative for something. 
but I never see them in the neighborhood. I never see people painting in the community. They get mad at our black youth and our brown youth um, because they're shooting. There's nothing for them to do. Their parents don't have an education. They don't have elders on Ward 7 and 8. You know, when I come uptown, I can always say, okay, I can reach up to money or somebody. Porque me dan, they, they feel my soul. I did not feel connected to um, Columbia Heights and the elite black society of Washington, D.C. when I first came here. And I decided to teach in the most neglected part of D.C. But when I tell you, those kids are so smart. They are so brave. They want to say that they have a learning gap. During the pandemic, most of my students, all of my students, logged on to my classes. They found me on Instagram. They are so hungry to make it out. But my thing is, I don't want you to make it out and do the same thing that's happening. Like, I literally reach out to so many people in positions of power from Southeast, and they don't do nothing. So it's hard for me. Um, to say, okay, no es, ra no es clase, es raza, porque si sí es clase, es clase. La clase, la gente, cuando, cuando tú ya llegas a una etapa de success, you cannot forget who you are. You're from Chocolate City? Okay, well, chocolate babies are getting killed, you know? So that, it's hard for me to get that, so I don't know. That's a lot. I know. <laughs> yeah. Bad. Um, and, and here's what I'll say, um, if, if Brad allows me to. Oh, he told me I have two minutes? Okay, thank you, Brad. Um, <laughs> is that when I say it's an excuse to call, say it's not class, excuse me, it's not racist class, right, is w w with regard to a particular dynamic, right, that dynamic of, oh, if only somebody wasn't poor, um, then there wouldn't be a race problem. Because, you know, once they're rich, there won't be, there won't be racism. And that's where I say no. The, so, the, the, the research shows systematically that even when two people have the same socioeconomic status, right, uh, Latino, white, black, etc., there's still a di dis disparity in access right, for that black middle class person, for that black rich person, right, who can't get the cab at night, etc. Right. So not to say it's the same story for your children, right? But that's what I, I wanted to specify that that's what I was referring to. Now, is socioeconomic status a significant barrier? Of course it is, right? But I would also add on to what you were describing, the way in which socioeconomic status is racialized, right? So that is to say, all the things that we attribute right, uh, to people from a, so, a certain socioeconomic status is viewed as equal in part to what we say is blackness. Right? The, the, the two things coexist together. Right? Now, for children, I don't know if the book is for children, right? <laughs> um, but where a child could certainly identify in that book right, is with the initial chapters in particular with regard to facial tra uh, family trauma. The book is about all the ways in which, as I'd say about these issues of Latino racism, the scene of the family is the scene of the crime, all right? Every fight over hair, every don't go out into the sun, every pinch that nose with the clothespin, all of that, bendito la nena. Um, <laughs> all, right, all of that, right, that happens within the family nucleus, and unfortunately, too many children recognize, all right? the differentiation on familial affection across a skin line, right? a skin shade line, um, the different investments, so that siblings from the same, very same family with the very same socioeconomic status, you would think the same everything, they're siblings, they live in the same household. So time and time again, studies show that there is a racial disparity across those two siblings from light, because one it comes out lighter and the other comes out darker, right? Within Latino families, right? Uh, so, the, I, I guess where I want to close is like, you're right, I, I haven't done it all. I haven't, and I don't pretend to. You I don't pretend to. should do something in the hood. I need somebody to help me. Let's go, because my kids are rich in culture. Mm -hmm. I'm teaching and I'm going to cuss you now and I'm having the time of my life, but I need people to do their work yeah. in the hood. Let's talk. Okay. Oh, that's right. You got a whole DC powerhouse here. Okay. <laughs> I 
think that is it. Everyone, thank you all so much for coming. I'm going to pass it to Brad. All right, let's give a hand to our panel.